Hi, this is Park Howell, and welcome to The Business of Story. On today's show, you are going to witness the power of a purpose-told story that saved a symphony. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. This past October, I was eating my Subway sandwich, sitting at my desk, flipping through the Phoenix Business Journal over what all of us startup entrepreneurs would call a power lunch. Well, the paper had a special section called the C-Suite Awards, honoring Phoenix's top executives for 2017. Wiping the mustard off my fingers, I started thumbing through it when I came to the executive of the year, Jim Ward, CEO of the Phoenix Symphony. Now, this really caught my eye. I started reading the article, which detailed why he won this top honor, and I was blown away by his background in advertising, in Hollywood, and how he helped turn around our local symphony, literally taking it from a week away from being bankrupt to an organization that now contributes some $400 million annually to the local community. His vision he has created for the symphony is to become the arts leader in the revitalization of the arts in Arizona. So how did he do it? Well, on today's show, he'll describe how he got the organization, its musicians, and their union to play into a more powerful, purpose-driven brand story for themselves and for the community. He was the perfect candidate for the job, too, given his background in advertising, marketing, and Hollywood storytelling. Ward was president of Lucas Arts and senior vice president of Lucas Film Limited, where he was responsible for the business growth of the Star Wars and Indiana Jones franchises across the motion picture, television, home video, and video game revenue streams. His 30-year career actually began in advertising back in New York with Doyle Dane Birnbach. He then moved on to become Senior Vice President and General Manager of BBDO Los Angeles. From there, he moved up to Portland and widened Kennedy, where he was a worldwide account director. As an advertising executive, Jim has been involved in many major global product introductions, including Apple Computer's original PowerBook, Microsoft's Windows 95 with the Rolling Stones, and Nike's introduction of no other than Tiger Woods. Ward is a member of the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, served as chairman of the Entertainment Software Association in 2017, and was chairman of the creative committee for the 2016 San Francisco Olympic Bid Committee. In addition, he has been recognized as one of Advertising Age's top 100 marketers and was EPM's Entertainment Marketer of the Year. So you can see why the Phoenix Symphony lucked out by getting Jim on board just in time. So join me as I join Jim in his downtown office at the Phoenix Symphony as he describes how he and his team conducted one of the greatest turnarounds of an arts institution in Arizona and perhaps America. Hey, Jim, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, Park. You know, it's so awesome. I was just reading the Business Journal a couple of weeks ago, and I was going through some of the executives of the year and the CEOs of the year, and there you were. And I started reading about your background, and I'm like, oh, my God, I had no idea who was down there running the Phoenix Symphony. And then it started making so much sense to me because all of the really amazing things the symphony has been doing, at least in my eyes from a marketer looking in over the past five, six, seven years since you ta- you've taken over. So welcome. I mean, it's so great to have the Phoenix uh, symphony have someone like you at the helm well thank you how did that all come about well uh you know a number of years ago i had retired from lucasfilm and moved back to phoenix area uh i uh, was involved in venture capital which i still do today i'm a partner in a venture capital firm in san francisco but i wanted to move back and live here i love it and at that point in time i 
I went momentarily insane and ran for Congress. <laughs> and by the mere fact I'm talking to you means I didn't win, although many people suggest that I won because I didn't win. But at any rate, <laughs> one of the finance chairs of my campaign was a guy named C.A. Howlett. And uh, right. C.A. is very well known in the community. And C.A. was the chair of the symphony at the time. And uh, so a couple of months after the election, he called me and said, hey, Jim, I have no idea if you'd be interested in this. I'm calling everyone and everybody I know. But, you know, we're in some trouble down here. You're a turnaround guy. Would you mind coming down and kicking the tires for a few days on, on the Phoenix Symphony? And what C.A. didn't know is that I have a great passion for music. I was classically trained as a pianist from the age of six, and I played the oboe and bassoon and orchestras and ended up getting a, a minor in, in undergrad. And so I thought, for sure, how, how, how much fun could it be to let's go down and play with the symphony for a couple of days? And of course, no good deed goes unpunished, and those two days have turned into seven years. Uh, well, you guys have really been doing some amazing things down here. And now it's the 70th anniversary. It is. It's our Se 70th anniversary season. Yeah. 70 years at play. Is that what That's the brand right. theme is? Yeah, one of them. Yeah. 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 Um, so you and I have somewhat similar backgrounds in that I also studied music. I never got to the point of being classically trained because I kept pushing back on that. But I studied music composition and theory, got a degree in that, also one in communications. My livelihood over the past 30 years has been advertising and marketing. You started your life, your career in advertising and marketing with some pretty big names and some pretty big brands. Yeah, I did. I came out here way too long ago to, to age me to go to Thunderbird to get my master's in international Which is the management. Internet, right. Yeah. yeah. For those that you don't know, a very well acclaimed international school of, of management, business you, management. You bet. And uh, I was fortunate because they had a track in, in advertising and had a big project where you'd go out and pitch a, a client, if you will, and they'd give you a stipend and you put together a marketing advertising plan. They'd come in, you'd present it. Uh, but the teacher at the time was an ex-ad guy out of Chicago, and he would also bring in um, the ad agencies from New York, Chicago, and LA, and they would watch this. And, you know, maybe if you're lucky, you'd get an interview. And so I kind of fell into it and, and started my career with Doyle Dane Birnbach oh, yeah. on Madison Avenue in New York City uh, at a time when Bill Birnbach was still alive. And, you know, Doyle Dane was very much a part of that creative movement and vanguard. And so I spent a couple of years in, in New York uh, at Doyle Dane. And then uh, I went out to Los Angeles to BBDO, um, another agency, and ended up being running the BBDO office in, in LA. But our major claim to fame was the Apple computer business. And I was also the the, I, I ran the international global business for, mm -hmm. for Apple and, and had a lot of fun, um, during the, the Scully years. Um, and, oh, uh, so with the Scully years, that's when, when Jobs was out. Correct. And so Steve so had, Steve had already been pushed out. John had come in from Pepsi. So my, my tenure was from about, uh, 88 with Apple. It was about 88 to, to 94. And so, so we had a lot of great fun. Uh, we introduced the original power book to great success. Mm -hmm. We also introduced the Newton to great demise, right? <laughs> so you learn as you go along. But at any rate, so I ran the, the LA office of BBDO for, for a number of years. And then, uh, and then I went up to an agency called Wyden and Kennedy up in Portland, oh, Oregon. Yeah. Just a little agency. Just up a there. little yeah. one. Yeah. And, uh, and they uh, had just won the Microsoft business. And because of my tech background, uh, they, they lured me up there and I loved them and wanted to go work with them. And so I went up and ran the global Microsoft business and uh, introduced uh, Windows 95 with the Rolling Stones and Start Me Up and yeah. that whole whole campaign. And then went on to run the global Nike business, which Wyden and Kennedy was famous for. And so it was quite an honor for me to to take that on and, and uh, you know, across all of the sports verticals, but also introduced a young man to the world named Tiger Woods. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was really So, let, so let, let's go back to yeah, Thunderbird sure. for just a minute sure. now. Yeah. A really acclaimed school out in Glendale, Arizona, yeah. Peoria, Glendale, out in the west side. You wouldn't even, it's an old Air, Air Force base. That's right. And so you were going there for your international studies. Did you ever think that you wanted to get in advertising and marketing? Or was it something no. like kismet that it just happened and next thing you know, you're at Doyle Dane in, in New York and your yeah. career took off? No, it's one of those things I've been, I've been sort of, uh, you know, Forrest Gump in my life and being in the right place at the right time with the right people. Uh, you know, I, I, my undergrad, I was a poli sci major. I knew I didn't want to 
pers- I didn't know what to do, frankly. And ah, that's why you ran for Congress. You yeah, just had to get that out of your system. Yeah, okay. all things come back around. <laughs> but no, I uh, and I had an advisor then who actually was going to go to Thunderbird, and he said you should check it out. I did, and I didn't know anything about business. I had never taken a business class. But what intrigued me, I'll never forget is there's some some piece of literature that Thunderbird had that said, you know what, um, we have a diverse student body, not only internationally, of course, but also in terms of background. I remember they had a, a, a ballet major, and they had different people, and I thought, wow, that's really interesting to me. And so um, because it was international in flavor and that, and I, I, I liked that mm-hmm. aspect of it. And I felt that there were different people there. I, I literally applied, got in sight unseen, put my stuff in a Chevette and drove down and started at school. Then, you are dating yourself. Put your uh, stuff in a Chevette. I, I, I am dating myself. For those myself, of you that don't know yeah. what a Chevette is, you're going to have to look it up. We'll put a link in the show notes. Please don't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, but then again, I was fortunate because at the time at Thunderbird, there was a, a great a professor there named Paul Schlesinger, who was a, uh, an ex-ad guy from Leo Burnett in Chicago. And he had retired down here and he started this program called Interad. And um, you know, uh, and, and through that, uh, I finally began to understand maybe what I might be good at. Um, that, uh, and, and Park, you know, this, that this odd mix of, of creativity with business sense and the ability to work with teams. Thunderbird was all about teamwork and, 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 and sort of, you know, uh, supersized because you had team members from different cultures around the world. You had someone maybe from Japan and then Finland and from the Middle East on your team. And so you'd have to sort of like figure out how to motivate the team to get, get done. And as you know, in advertising and, and certainly in account work, you're responsible for motivating, you know, copywriters and art directors and research people and media people and a whole team to service a client, but also achieve a goal. And, and all of that just was fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. And so, and at the time in the early eighties was the vast expansion of what became the holding companies to purchase agencies internationally. So there's yeah. a whole focus on the international and, and the, 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 the exploration of what is a global brand and what does mm-hmm. that mean? And is it local? Is it, you know, whatever. So anyway, all of that was fascinating to me. And I just found something that was really cool and seemed to, to play well. Yeah. So, so you got pulled up, caught up in the advertising uh, vortex with all your skills and background. And then you transitioned out of that and got into doing work in and around Hollywood, bringing your branding and your account skills to Hollywood, working with Lucas Arts first and then Lucas no, Film. Lucas Do I that Fel- right? Yeah, okay. Lucas Film's the parents company, parent mm-hmm. company. And uh, yeah, no, I was, Wine and Kenny, I loved it. I still love them. They're fantastic. Yeah. One day I got a, a cold call from a headhunter and said, hey, Lucasfilm is looking for someone to come in and help them with the next stage of their development. George is going to go and self-finance the next round of Star Wars movies and they they need some help. And, um, and I thought, uh, this is how much I didn't know. I, I thought Lucasfilm was in LA and I said, look, I spent 10 years in LA. I don't know if I want to go back. Um, you know, Hollywood seems how like Hollywood, I had all the stereotypes in my mind and the headhunter was like, well, look, look, first of all, Lucasfilm isn't in Hollywood. It's in the Bay area, uh, in the first place. And secondly, you know, this is kind of an interesting opportunity. I told the guy, no, I don't want to talk about it. I was like an idiot. Um, so about a month later, he called back and he said, look, you know, they, they are interested in talking to people outside of Hollywood. Why don't you have a talk with the then president and see what you think? So I did great guy dear friend of mine named Gordon Radley. And, you know, it was great. So long story short, I ended up, you know, meeting with George. And so I, I said, George, you know, why, why would you want to hire a guy like me? I, I've never launched a movie in my life. I don't know anything about how, I don't know anything about this industry, you know? And he said, well, that's exactly why he said, he said, look, I'm sitting on top of a multi-billion dollar worldwide, multiple franchises, frankly. And you know, uh, what Hollywood does is they put buttons and seats for movies, but I want to manage this like the brands that they are, Star Wars, Indiana Jones. I want to do it internationally. That's kind of what you do. And so he said, but look, you know, if, if you're going to consider taking this job, you got to realize something. I'm going to send you down into Hollywood. They're not going to like you. They're going to call you an outsider. Um, they're going to try to kill you and they're going to come up here and try to get me to fire you by the way, all of which came to pass. Um, but he said, um, if you're up for it, 
you're going to go down there and in your naivete, you're going to ask them the questions they think they already have the answers to. And that's how we're going to rock their world. You know, and he had me right there. I, how can you turn and you that said, down? I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, yeah. So how then, long were you there then with Lucas? I was Stone? there for over a decade, 11 years. Yeah, so you reignited the Star Wars franchise and helped them get it, it, exactly that going in the right. next round of, of movies? That's right. I was there for the episodes, what we called one, two, and yes. three. Yeah. Um, the episodes my boys grew up on as I grew up on the first episodes. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so I created a marketing division. I mean, George needed to create the infrastructure because he was self-financing this and, and, and didn't have the affinity and love affair with Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, I created a marketing division, distribution division, online division, went on to be a corporate officer, and then also president of LucasArts, which was the video game company uh, of, of the Lucasfilm portfolio, but also um, uh, senior vice president in charge of all of our revenue streams from the theatrical business, home video, television, video games, et cetera, et cetera, across all of our assets. What an exciting time for you, I'd imagine. Oh, a lot was, of work, but a lot of fun. It was phenomenal. It was just a, 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 a magical place. Skywalker Ranch is magical and uh, just being around that that period of time yeah. was just fantastic. Do you miss it? Yeah, I, sure. I, I miss the people. I miss mm -hmm. Lucasfilm's now part of Disney. It's a whole different, it's a whole different, thing, different yeah. thing now. But back certainly when we were, I was there, yeah, I, I, I miss that. But, you know, 11 years is a long run. Um, and there, you know, it was a lot going on and I felt mm. that I had done kind of all I could do at that point. And, you know, it was, you know, probably yeah. a good time to leave, but I, I, yeah, I miss it. And, and a lot of still great dear friends are, are there and, um, it's a wonderful, wonderful. Memory. So then you, you said you came back to Phoenix. Uh, where did you grow up? Was it? I, I grew up in Rockford, Illinois, outside okay. of Chicago. So but you, then you came to boy. Phoenix for Thunderbirds, so that's where you, you I found went to your under, affinity? undergraduate at Hanover College, which is a small school in the Midwest. Indiana? And, uh, in right? Indiana, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, southern mm -hmm. Indiana. And then, uh, yeah, and then, then packed the Chevette and came down here to Phoenix. And again, I, I had never really been west of the Mississippi. And so, you know, the drive down was amazing. And then I'll never forget, I tooled into to Flagstaff. And I started in, in January, the January semester at Thunderbird. And I tooled into Flagstaff and went to bed at a motel. And I was going to take the rest of the trip the next day. Got up and it was, it had snowed. It had snowed. Being from the Midwest, I wasn't afraid of snow. Chicago, are you kidding me? So I just got on 17 and started down, not knowing, understanding mountains and chains. Uh, I, I didn't know anything about that. Then you hit the Mogollon Rim. And, and yeah. <laughs> the state trooper pulled me over and was like, you know, what are you doing? And by that way, I'd kind of, I'd made enough way down. He said, hey, you're fine. Just keep going. So then I descend down into the valley and I'd never seen anything like this. It was like going to another planet. And I just fell in love with the geography, everything about it. It was just magical to me. Yeah. So it was great. Well, and what's interesting for those of you that aren't familiar with Arizona, Jim, so you came through uh, Flagstaff, which is up at 7,000 feet. Yes. It's on the Kaibab Plateau. Beautiful. And one of the largest, if not the largest stand of ponderosa pine forest in the world. And then you make your way gradually about 20 miles and you hit the Mogollon Rim, which then dropped from about 6,000 feet to 2,000 feet yes. in the course of about 10 miles. Right. Yeah. And it's pretty exciting. And then you yeah. drop down in the high desert and then the low desert. And yeah. it's really kind of a magical place that you, if you're not ready for that, you would never expect it. At That's least that was my experience. Yeah, me too. It. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So then you got done with that. You came back to Phoenix, venture capital play. You're working with some friends out here and they say, hey, come and help us with the, the symphony. So well, tell I us had, I had, you know, I'd retired from Lucasfilm and a, a dear friend of mine had a, a venture capital firm and, and I, I joined that, but I could kind of live wherever I needed to for that. And that's, I came back to, to the symphony, ran for Congress and, and then came down here. And, um, okay, I got to stop you. Why yeah. Congress? You have all this stuff going. What was it about running for Congress that really had you going? And what year was that? This was the 2010 cycle. 2010. Okay. Yeah. Uh, although I came back here in 2008 and kind of, began the, mm -hmm. the, the quest. Park, at that point in my life, I, I felt that I'd been very fortunate. This country and this world had given me a lot. Uh, I felt I wanted to give back. Uh, I have two adopted daughters from China. I was concerned about the course of the country at that point, uh, as I am even now, and wanted to make sure that I wasn't taking them from a 
a bad situation in China to a worse one here. And so I thought, what, what could I possibly do? Obviously, I had a political science background, so it always, government has interested me. So I thought that, that I could do that. But what I found, quite honestly, is that coming down here and being part of the Phoenix Symphony has certainly scratched the itch to give back to this community. And frankly, probably in a more meaningful way had I been stuck in gridlock back in Washington, D.C., because we've managed to keep the music alive for this community. And there's so many benefits of that that really felt a, a way to give back was been through the Phoenix Symphony. Yeah. I experienced something with the symphony a few years ago that was really different for me. So I, I think I felt your branding and marketing touch on it and didn't realize it or who was at the helm. But uh, um, very kind, uh, your principal clarinetist, um, Alexander Lang, invited me to come down and listen to the rehearsal for John Williams. And you were doing a benefit for John Williams and Steven Spielberg were in town for this yeah. night. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I hadn't heard about it. Told my wife, I said, we got to get tickets. So we did at the last minute. And the only thing that was left were the expensive ones down front. And I said, right on, that's a good excuse because I want to be down front and seeing it, having a background in music. But to be able to sit there... I can still remember this, Jim. Row four, seat eleven, looking up, and I and and John Williams was just up to my right, and he came out to work with the the orchestra for two hours, and I was mesmerized to see how this brilliant musician, conductor, composer worked with his with the people. That one time they were playing um, one of the overtures. I can't even remember what tune it was from Harry Potter. And the pianist didn't have it quite right. He was, uh, Williams was looking for something and he said, let's try that again. And he, he played something and he goes, no, not quite right. And Williams gave him one of the most brilliant directions. He said, like water, think of that little trill like water. And so they went on and they rehearsed that little segment again, water. And he looked at him and he goes, yep, that's it. That's it right there. And then to my amazement that night, how many, many, many hours later that evening, the full, uh, the place was completely filled. My wife and I happened to be sitting to the seat, the row right behind where I was. I mean, our seats were that good. I'm like, I was right here, so we're going to see this whole thing again. Well, when that tune came up, when that piece came up, and it was playing, and it got to that part, I was curious if Williams would even recognize it, or if he was just so caught up in what was going on, he wasn't going to worry with that nuance. Well, as he played through it, the pianist played it beautifully, and Williams gave him a knowing nod, looked over with everything else going on, like, yes, that's you, you hit it beautifully. And I just, I was so blown away by his attention to detail, and even more so, his humanity in that moment. And then Spielberg comes out on stage, and he came out halfway through the program. And our son went to Arcadia High School over here. One of their big claims to fame has always been, well, Steven Spielberg right. went to school here. And I was never sure if that was quite true or not. And sure enough, he comes out and he sits on stage and he says, it's wonderful to be back. And oh, by the way, I went to school just down around the corner at Arcadia High School. Yeah. And I was like, yes, okay. So we have that connection. And our son has gone on and he's in, in film. Well, went to film school at Chapman University. And now he's in Hollywood, motion designer, and um, doing a lot of work now in directing virtual reality films. Mm -hmm. So it was a really special connection mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. that night. It was so amazing to me that someone in this operation was able to bring in that quality of, of, of people for this benefit. And then, after seeing the write-up in the paper a few weeks ago, I go, oh, now it totally makes sense. Right. So yeah. how was that kind of, because it just felt like a completely different Phoenix Symphony for me during that, that show. How, what have you done here, or how have you brought your advertising, branding, marketing, and, and Hollywood film world thinking to make a symphony even more relevant than it was. Yeah. Well, Park, let me, let me tell you a, a story, if, if I may, sure. because it's uh, right up uh, Joseph Campbell's alley and the archetypes and the hero's journey, right? And I'm not the hero, but these musicians of the Phoenix Symphony are. So when I came down to the symphony, the symphony was a week away from bankruptcy. And had Arizona's largest arts organization gone down, it would have been another nail in the coffin of our ability as a community to attract and retain the kinds of businesses that we need for economic development. So we had to move very, very quickly and perform a lot of triage. Um, typical art situation, there was overspending, the budget was bloated, et cetera. Um, and so we needed to cut that budget and right-size the ship. 
in a symphony organization, over 50% of your overhead is, is due to your musicians, and that's good, and that's normal. Um, but anytime you're going to make a change, you've got to sit down with your musicians. They're a unionized workforce that we have here, part of the National Federation of Musicians. And so um, I had to sit down with our musicians and say, guys, look, we got to open up your, your contract here. But the rub came, these musicians had taken a 19% cut in their pay a couple years prior more than any other American orchestra up until that point in time. And they were due for a snapback or a restoration of it that coming summer, uh, which was adding to our financial pressures. So um, my unenviable task is, is this new guy coming in was, hey guys, not only do we have to open up your contract, but that the money we owe you this summer, we, we're not in a position to pay it. So you guys have a horrible Hobson's choice here. You can walk and go on strike. And frankly, I don't blame you if you did. Or you can take a giant leap of faith on a guy who's never run a nonprofit, never run a symphony, and in full disclosure, ran as a Republican against card check and busted unions up at Lucasfilm. But if you take that giant leap of faith, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have an open and honest communication and, and culture. I'm going to give you every piece of information that you need and have not had in the past to make an informed decision. We're going to agree that you have what you need. We're going to agree on the implications of the data. And I think you'll agree with me, this is unsustainable. And then I need you to teach me about this business and how together we can solve the problems. Because many of you have been here 30 years I bet you've got great ideas. You're going to be on our board. You're going to be on all of our music, all of our committees, and you're going to be partners. But most importantly, you're going to educate me about how to do this. And to their credit, and I, and I, I have to tell this story everywhere I go. To their credit, they forgave that snapback to give me enough runway for uh, a turnaround. And they did something that's unique in, in America today, in a unionized workforce. They put the needs of this community before their own needs in order to keep music alive for ourselves and for our children. And I don't care who you are. If you don't like classical music, you don't like the aesthetic, you owe these guys to come down to Symphony Hall, buy mm -hmm. one ticket, and give them a round of applause because they are true heroes. So with that, we began our journey to begin to turn around the organization, and we, it was scorched earth. Uh, you know, we had to cut staff, we had to rebuild, we rebuilt the board, uh, we had to uh, rebrand, uh, reboot marketing, reboot development. Um, but the most important thing that drove our narrative and our branding, and as you know, Park, very well, is we had to go back and visit a mission and, and vision for what we were. And our musicians came to me early on and said, Jim, we don't we don't buy the mission of this place. And I said, well, I'm embarrassed. I don't even know what it is. And they said, well, in so many words, it's we want to be the next L.A. Philharmonic. And while seemingly aspirational, there were three fatal flaws to that. The first was it suggested to our musicians that they weren't as good as L.A., and what, whether it's not the case, but even if it were, that's not a way to motivate a creative workforce, right? Mm -hmm. Secondly, the previous regime had gone out into this community and said, hey, we want to be the LA Philharmonic. And of course, this community is like, well, we're Arizona and Phoenix, and frankly, we don't like LA, and we're fighting for them over water, and what are you talking about, right? And the third thing they began to do is spend like the LA Philharmonic, which is what got us into the financial problems that we had. So I said, well, look, guys, um, here's all I know. I just ran for Congress. And the dialogue in this community, unfortunately, has nothing to do with the arts, has nothing to do with the symphony, let alone the LA Philharmonic. The dialogue in this community is all about our inability to uh, expand and diversify our economy to attract and retain the kinds of businesses we need for economic development. And oh, by the way, when Craig Barrett says, maybe I shouldn't have brought Intel to the state of Arizona because we're 49th in the nation in education. These are the issues this community is grappling with. And therefore, we're going to have to align our needs with the needs of this community and be part of a solution. Um, and so we sat down with our musicians and our board and adopted a vision, which we still have today, which is we will be Arizona's largest arts leader in the revitalization of Arizona. In our own way, we're going to help solve the challenges that this state has. And our mission became to leverage what's unique to us, the joy of music, in three distinct ways. The first is to continue to feed the soul of this community aspirationally. 
Uh, but second, it's to bolster a cultural economy because we know a cultural economy is critical to that economic development that we were talking about. Um, you know, the arts in Phoenix alone have an economic impact of over $400 million a year. And guess what? That's on par with the Super Bowl. And you know what? We deliver a Super Bowl every single year to this community, not every five or seven. That $400 million is more than spring training. It's more than the golf tournaments. It's more than any of the sports that we have here. It's a huge economic impact. And also, we know that in order to attract those businesses, you have to have a thriving cultural economy. The number one buyer of Steinway pianos in America today are doctors. This state has made a dramatic investment in the biotech vertical, TGen, et cetera. We know from talking to headhunters, the number three thing on anybody's checklist to relocate here in the biomed tech arena, doctors, health, whatever, is culture. And so it's a critical aspect to what we do. We need to bolster this cultural economy. And the third part of our mission became to educate the next generation of a creative workforce. So we have the human capital necessary for that economic development. And by the way, we impact over 125,000 kids every single year through our education and community outreach programs, which is second only to the Department of Education. And so with this vision and mission, we were then able to create strategies and branding and everything around so that we could go back out into this community, repair burned bridges, build new bridges, and begin to uh, create a thriving organization. So coming in where before the vision was we need to be better than our competition over there as musicians, totally changing that story. They're saying, no, actually, it's not about that, because who's to say that you're not already as good, if not better than them? It's about using music as a vehicle to be something more in this community than just a symphony. Symphony is just simply the vehicle to get there. Yes. Did the musicians, how involved were they in coming up with this vision, too? I mean, did you have to kind of shake them out of, of tunnel vision that no. we all get, or no. were they all about it? No, not at all. I mean, we are fortunate to have musicians that care desperately about this community and giving back to this community. Um, what I discovered, Park, was that when I went out to start to talk to people and evangelize this vision and mission, they basically say, Jim, you know, this sounds all great and everything, but we're on the tail end of a recession. We've got limited dollars. And at the end of the day, we've got to prioritize health and human services and people above you guys just playing nice music in the theater. And, and it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. This symphony is not your, your grandfather's symphony, right? Um, you know, we, we impact all these children. And, and frankly, it became apparent to me that I had to pivot the fundamental positioning of this organization away from a perception of nice musicians playing in Symphony Hall to the fact that we are truly impacting this, this uh, community. And therefore, we dramatically expanded because our musicians want to do this our ability to get out into the community. And we did so using programs that we could quantifiably measure so that when I went in to ask for money, uh, being on the other side of the ask many times myself, I would have the, the statistical data to prove the efficacy of the interventions in classrooms or with Alzheimer's patients or wherever we were impacting this community. We had the data to prove that, wow, we were really making a difference. And in fact, we had more data oftentimes than the organizations that supposedly were impacting those communities. We were measuring it. And so this became a big part of what we are, are about because our musicians care desperately about going out in this community and doing that. Yeah. Going back to uh, the Williams and um, program. Halfway through that rehearsal, they took a break, which I thought was cool. They, you know, you know, hour, hour and a half in, whatever. But then the musicians didn't disappear. They actually came out into the crowd. And I would say there might have been maybe a hundred of us there, 150 invited to be there. So it really was a special event. And they came out and talked with us. And the thing that struck me about them is how happy they all seemed. And they just seemed like, yeah, this is cool. I remember talking to um, one of the trumpetists and I asked him, I said, you're playing all this music. You just did a different show last night. You're doing this tonight. How long do you rehearse? And he said to me, he goes, well, you know, 
Park, we've already know this music because we've played it before. And he goes, I might put four or five hours into it to prepare for tonight. And I was blown away. I said, really? I mean, it's just, it's lodged in there. And of course, the performance was amazing. And he said, yeah, he goes, I don't want to over-prepare. I want to be a little bit surprised by the music that's coming up. Mm -hmm. So I know the music, but I also want to be able to bring myself out in it. And I thought that was really interesting. I just assumed they would like, practice, 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 but I guess they're so good at what they do that they just to be able to come out and do it naturally. And so I com combine that with what you're talking about here is the, the symphony is just an, uh, um, an automatic way to connect the arts with culture, but I think it, it, with the community, but I think most people are just dialed in and we're just going to play Beethoven this week or Mozart right. or something, yeah. but it's so much more than that, almost unpracticed in some ways that you live uh, uh, um, tr kind of improv in some respects. And what are we going to do out in the community this week to see what happens? And i give you another, for instance, is you all were over at uh, Mesa last year about this time, and we had friends that had never seen Cirque du Soleil, and they hadn't been to the symphony in forever. And so we said, well, let's go over to Mesa Art Center. And, and the Phoenix Symphony was there. And you guys did this program with Cirque du Soleil. And it was so different than anything I'd ever seen before. And it blew them away. So now, you know, they've got booked to go up to Vegas and watch Cirque du Soleil. And they're buying tickets to go to the symphony. Yeah. So yeah. it's that kind of thing to me that felt like it was more improvisational now and what you were doing on a business model going out, if that makes sense. Well, that, that takes a lot of planning. Look, yeah. you know, we when I came on board, the... The median age of a symphony goer is 72 years old. It's 49 today. Yeah. So that takes a lot of work. It takes repertoire planning. It takes uh, a, a lot of uh, expansion of the, the ability to attract more younger and, and diverse audiences. Um, you know, last season we had the highest ticket sales in the history of the symphony, highest attendance levels. And yeah. that's through the ability of talented musicians to mm -hmm. play different repertoire from a Cirque du Soleil show like yeah. that. And by the way, we, we're doing it this year. We have a Nutcracker I Cirque saw that. show. So yeah. go see that out in Mesa. But at any rate, also to, to remain true to their core and classical music yeah. as well. So they're quite virtuosic in their ability to, to play all the different kind it, of repertoire. It's unbelievable. And I probably shouldn't care characterize it as improvisational because I know it's well thought out. What I would say is surprising from the community looking in of what you're doing here yes. in different yes. ways of expressing yes. the symphony. That's probably a better no, way to absolutely. say it. Yeah. And, and thanks to folks like you that give us an outlet to talk about it, you know, because there isn't an interest. Look, unfortunately, the challenge that the arts have in this community is that this community mm -hmm. is not geared to supporting the arts. Philanthropically, um, the burden has fallen on individuals and foundations. The governmental institutions in Phoenix and, and at the state level do not support the arts at the mm -hmm. level of any counterpart by any measure across the country. We have an economic impact, as I mentioned before, of $400 million a year. That's equivalent to the economic impact of the arts in Miami. Miami supports the arts at a budget of $32 million a year. The city of Phoenix supports us at $1.2 million a wow. year, yet Miami is half the size of Phoenix. So great disparity here in, the, in, in that. So therefore, we have to work a little harder in terms of keeping our head above water uh, in these environments and also at the same time be creative and, and innovative uh, uh, about how we, we do that. Have you ever considered, Jim, that the universe actually didn't want you to become a congressman because you can have way more impact in the position you have right now? Well, that's what I was saying. Yeah, yeah, this has definitely scratched the itch to give back. There's no doubt. And frankly, listen, all every step of the way in my career, I've been involved in some sense of a creative environment, right? right. And and this is yet another one of those. So I tell you, it's a, it's so much fun to you know, every, this is the entertainment business. Every single week we're doing a different show and being around 66 Juilliard Curtis yeah. level trained musicians is an honor. And I learned so much from them. And, uh, yeah, this probably really is a much better gig than uh, being stuck in a committee room with what's going on in Washington, D.C. right now. So I've got to ask you, of course, since you're on business of story here, how has story then, how have you seen it really impact not only your career, but then the careers that you've built and the, the brands that you've represented? And at least from my eyes, after doing this you know business for 30 years, it seemed like we got away from story for a long time. And now there's a renewed emphasis on it. How have you seen it work and how would you recommend to our listeners to use it in their own lives, especially um, when you're working with a purpose-driven brand like you are here at the Phoenix Symphony? Sure. Well, listen, narrative is critical to 
anything that you do, whatever the business it is. Um, certainly in the symphony, we have to tell stories through our art form clearly and have to have arcs and themes around that. But we have to raise money. And when you raise money from somebody, yeah, there's facts and figures. The, at the end of the day, they, they want to hear a story. Yeah. And they want to hear a very positive narrative that motivates them. And so, um, listen, I've been fortunate in my career to have worked with master storytellers in their own right. I, I did end up working with Steve Jobs at, at Pixar, and he's a master manipulative storyteller in a positive way. <laughs> in a positive so, manipulative yeah, way. Yeah, that's okay. right. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I've gotten to work with John Scully, you know, um, uh, Bill Gates, uh, Steve Ballmer, Phil Knight at Nike. I mean, Nike's all about yeah. narratives. Have you um, read his book, by the way? I have. Yeah. It's fabulous. It's absolutely right. Well, it, he's a brilliant guy. It's one big long you know, story from when they started out. It's just well done. You bet. Oh, yeah. But on the advertising side, you know, guys like Phil Dusenberry, and I worked directly with oh. Steve Hayden, who wrote the famous 1984 commercial, and of course, Dan Wyden, uh, uh, Wyden and Kennedy. Um, but then ultimately, the ultimate storyteller, George Lucas. And I know. Park, you're an advocate of Joseph Campbell. And that's basically George read that book. Yeah. And Star Wars was born out of that the hero's journey. And those archetypes are embedded in Star Wars. And so, you know, for, for those 11 years, I sat at the right hand side of a guy who is creating the new chapters of Star Wars. And how does that happen? And then, and then how do you supplement narrative with techniques that bring it to life? Like, special effects and creating a company like Industrial Light and Magic? And how do you extend narrative into different technology forms like video games? So narrative to me and storytelling is critical to any, I don't care what business you're in, whether you're a, you think you're an accountant in a bank or what, it, it, narrative is critical to success. Yeah, and Jim, and when you were, uh, had to have that very hard job of approaching your musicians and bring them into a narrative of saying, look it, You've got to trust me, even though I've never done this before in my life, and we can't give you what you're looking for. But that is a narrative, too. But as the honesty and authenticity is the only way that that's going to work. Absolutely. And particularly with folks that maybe hadn't necessarily had the benefit of uh, being, being open and honest. Uh, uh, so, yes, I think it was refreshing uh, to them. But, yeah, that's, that, that's certainly a narrative. And, you know, uh, so far, so good. It's a... Uh, a happy ending. So 70th anniversary. Yes. Where do you go from here? Well, God, let's do another 70 years, but I don't want to be around for the next uh, 70th anniversary. But uh, no, listen, where we're going from here is what we call Symphony 2.0, which is a strategic business plan that we have with just nothing less than reimagining what an American orchestra needs to be in the 21st century. It involves collaboration. It involves technological advance, advancement. It's called, it, it calls for being, having a frictionless relationship with our patrons. It calls for, uh, creating programming that's diverse and younger. It, it, uh, calls for, uh, distribution pipelines that are different. Uh, so it's really reinventing ourselves and that's what's very exciting and again we're very fortunate um, not only to have musicians that understand that which is not always the case across this country but to have a very young and enthusiastic music director in Tito Munoz who uh, is of the generation that digests media in different ways and he understands and is eager to push the envelope in a way and so collectively we're going to try to do that while continuing to serve this community through all of our outreach programs so that we can, in fact, help, uh, you know, revitalize Arizona. Yeah. So your background from international studies to advertising marketing to Hollywood and now, you know, help saving a, a cultural institution here have all come together to this moment. And you're doing some really amazing things. So congratulations. Well, thank and you. We, we are so lucky to have you here in Phoenix. And thank you so much for being on today's show. I really appreciate it, Jim. Well, thanks so much, Bart. And thank you all for listening to this edition of Business of Story. Um, I hope you were as excited about it as I was because Jim and I have led a bit of a parallel life in advertising, marketing, and our studies in music. And what he and his team have done here um, has just blown me away. So I'm, I'm glad that the universe opened this up and got us have a chance to, to talk. I hope you all can put this to use. Join us next week when we will have another story artist here to help you craft and tell compelling stories that sell. And until then, remember, the most important story you are ever going to tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. See you soon. <laughs>